And God, we just thank you right now. Right now in your own words, would you just close your eyes and begin to thank the Lord. God, you are so good to us. You are so good to us, Jesus. The gift of the cross as we get ready for Easter, the wonder of your resurrection, God, there was no other way. There was no other way than you sending your son to pay the price for our sin. So we just thank you. We just thank you, God. Would you be worshiped in this house this morning? Would you just be the main focus of our hearts as we sing your praise and as we just glorify your name, Jesus? You are worth it. Everything I have, God, you are worth it. So I give it to you freely this morning. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, a shout of praise this morning. King of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on the cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished. Not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. A sacrifice was made as the heavens rose. Let us 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This morning we get to take communion together as a family. But you know, this week, I felt like the Lord challenging me, and I think he's challenging us as a body. What is your heart condition today? What is your heart condition? You see, Jesus had a heart that was submitted to the Father. He had a, he had a heart of surrender. He had a heart of servanthood. And he surrendered and he gave it all. But his heart was for the kingdom. His heart was for you and I. And in 1 Corinthians, I believe Paul touched on this. Paul knew the heart of Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks, and I'm just going to paraphrase this. He talks about how you and I our heart condition, where's it at? You see, because if you and I are in wrong standing with the Lord, then there's a whole lot of heaping we're going to be doing. Do you have the heart of Christ this morning? That's the question. And I believe each one of us, we have to take this, this inventory of who we are. Am I standing right with Jesus? Do I have a heart that is submitted to the King? Is my heart in right standing with my fellow man? And I want to do something different. I want us, when, when the worship team sing this next song, I want us to, to pause and evaluate who we are in Jesus. You see, because Monday when I showed up, to the church, if I was to take communion Monday morning, I think God would have slapped me stupid because my heart was in the wrong place. And all God said was, make it right. Make it right. Trust me and make it right. And before we take communion, I'm going to ask us as a family I'm going to have the altar team come up, our prayer team. If you need to stand with someone in agreement in prayer, do it. Do it. I'm not saying maybe. I'm not saying if. I'm saying do it. If there's somebody in this room that you have issues with, make it right. Because I believe Paul's challenging you and I to get it right. When we come to the table of the Father, we need to come with a heart that is open, that is clean, that is pure, that is in right standing with Him. You see, Jesus modeled this for you and I. Jesus always contended for His heart to be in the right place. And I believe you and I, we need to make sure that our heart's in the right place. If you need to come up here up front, and just say, hey, God, just purify me. Lord, wherever there's bitterness in my heart, can you just, can you wash over that? Can you clean it out? And then I want you to go back and take communion with your family. Take communion with a friend. But I want us to be in right standing with God. I want to be in right standing with God. So, Father, as we take this time as we take this time just to look to you, Lord, our hearts point into you. Lord, I pray for each person in here today that our hearts would be in right standing, that we would have a heart that is sold out for you. Lord, we, are, we would have hearts of Christ, that we would have hearts of a servant, 
hearts that are submitted to you. And Lord, hearts that are going to sacrifice for you. Lord, you gave it all for us. And Lord, as we take this time in this next song, as we take this time to pause and just align ourselves with you, Lord, I pray that you would speak into those deep places in each one of us. Lord, let nothing be hidden. Lord, I pray that you would bring everything out to the light. Lord, if I have issue with my brother, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that by your spirit and that I would go and make that right before I take communion. And Lord, I pray that you would move in a mighty way, that as we take communion as a family, Lord, we do it in right standing because you are a God of right standing. And Lord, we want to be in right standing with you. Because Lord, with that right standing, there is a blessing that you want to deposit in this house today. So fathers, we take this time to evaluate who we are. Lord, let us not, let us not do this nonchalantly. Let us not skip over this, but Lord, let us have right hearts. Lord, I want, to, I want clean hands and a pure heart. And I want to be in right standing with you in the name of Jesus. Grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still. My 
sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still. I On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken. This is my body that I give for you. This is my body given for you. Take, eat. And in the same way, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. You and I get to live in a new covenant with Christ because of the blood that he shed. The new covenant for the remission of sin. Take drink in remembrance of me. Father, as we enter in to the season of remembering all that you sacrificed for us, all that you sacrificed for us, Lord, you came and you made a way when there was no way. You gave it all when nobody but you had anything to give. When we didn't deserve it, you came so we could have the abundant life with you. So, Father, my prayer is, Lord, that each one of us, we remember the greatness of what you've done. And, Lord, you continue to pour out your greatness You continue to move in our lives in a mighty way. Lord, we could not do life without you. So, Father, as we celebrate, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, as our eyes look forward to that, Lord, we're celebrating right now. This isn't a dark place, but it's a place of victory. Lord, you came and you conquered so we could conquer, so we could have life in you, this great life that you've given us. Lord, I pray that each one of us, Lord, would grab a hold and never let go. And Lord, today we celebrate Jesus Christ. There is no name greater than Jesus Christ. And we celebrate who you are. And we rejoice who you are. Lord, would you just come, would you, would you just fill our hearts with your joy and with your love and with your peace. And Lord, would you just move in this house today as we celebrate Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen, church. How great is our God. Sing with me how great. How 
great is our God. How great is our God. See with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see.
awake in this city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. may be darkest but your light is greater you light our way God you light our way when evil is rising you're rising higher with power to save with power to save you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end, your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. Death had a stronghold, but your life was stronger. Rose from the grave, rose up from the alive in McCall, Idaho. Amen, church. His name is Jesus. He's the one that brought you life. He's the one that breaks the chains. He's the one that your freedom is in, and his name is Jesus. Amen, church. Come on, give him a shout. Give him a clap. Give him a praise. 
His name is Jesus. And there is no other name greater than the name of Jesus. No other person that is greater than the person of Jesus Christ. Amen, church. Today we celebrate who you are, Lord. Man, you came and you gave it. And you gave it in a way that man just wrecked us. It turned our lives upside down and it turned our lives right side up. And Lord, we celebrate who you are. The victory is yours and we get to walk in that victory. Lord, the freedom is yours and we get to walk in that freedom. Lord, the life is in you and we get to walk in that life. Lord, you've broken the chains. You've set the captives free. And Lord, we will ever, forever, forever sing your praises. Jesus, you are it. You keep my hope alive. Amen, church. Give someone a high five next to you. Tell them Jesus is your hope today. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. There you go. And if you're a guest, I'm sorry you came today. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, no, seriously, we're so glad to have you. And if you're online watching us today, we just want to give a shout out. Oh, by the way, um, so, uh, hey, would you give a shout out to my wife, Heidi, who's online today? Actually, hopefully she'll actually be here, but she'll see it anyway. Um, uh, so, uh, so for those of you, if you're wondering where, where she is, um, we're taking the season um, to allow her to be down in the valley where there's no snow and it's warmer. We got a little apartment down there. Um, we're getting a little bit of little get little bit of time together down there. We're just it's working out for us on our days off to have a break, and then Samuel and I come back up here, and she's staying down there so she can get healthy. And she's spending a lot of time at Walmart and Target walking around. And if you've and if you've seen our Target video, you know she's getting a lot of exercise at Target because you can. You can do that. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so if you're, if you're wondering, we're doing great, we're doing fine. And by the way, she's actually doing church at home and hosting down there and being a part of an intercessory prayer on Sunday mornings. If you want to know more about that, let us know. Um, and so she is actively engaged with us down there while, while she's doing that. And also, uh, she's getting to enjoy that there's no snow, if that were a thing. Well, it is Palm Sunday, uh, and I want to talk today um, about this, ev this amazing event that you probably have heard. Uh, I, I know I've preached it a number of times, uh, but I want to I take a look as we are concluding our series on the life of Christ. I want to talk about, uh, as we, we've explored who Jesus is and, and the way that he came and the way that his message was right side up in an upside down world, and, and the way that, that, that Jesus approached everything affected people so differently. There were those that, that immediately fell on their faces and were like, Lord, Lord. And then there are those that had the opposite reaction to him. And do you know that still today, that over 2,000 years later, people still have the same kinds of reactions to Jesus? There are those that immediately receive his grace and fall on their face and say, Lord, Lord. And there's those that cuss him and, and swear at him, and even those that would use his name as a cuss word. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. But we all, we all respond to Jesus one way or another, and I want to take a look at that today. Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter in Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse six. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set, set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed crying, cried out saying, Hosanna! 
to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Come on, let me hear you. Wow, that was good for not even practicing. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So when Jesus arrives on the scene, now he'd been around, his reputation had gone before him, many had already seen him, money had been touched by him, many had been offended by him. But this is the Sunday before his, his betrayal, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection three, on the third day. And this is, this is the lead in to what many call or have called for centuries Holy Week. And this is the week where there are so many things happen in this one week period. Over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament are fulfilled in this one week. 300. A while back, Pastor Sean shared some statistics about how uh, statistically impossible Jesus' life was and how statistically impossible it would have been for him to do all of these things, let alone over 300 in one week. But in, in Jesus' arrival, and I, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip ahead. We have scripture references, and I'll, ha- I'll make the notes available online as well. You know, the, this account is also recorded in Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. And in the other accounts, it gives some other perspectives. One, one is dialogue that's happening among the Pharisees where they're, they're talking about, they're seeing that Jesus is drawing a crowd. And one of them makes the statement and, and says, says, see, we're losing control, I'm paraphrasing. And if we're not careful, the whole world is gonna run after him. This is a response from the Pharisees. And in their case, their response was out of of jealousy. Their response was, was out of fear. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They believed that he was a heretic. But most of all, they were afraid of the influence that he was having that was stealing the people's attention away from them. Jesus was hurting business. He was hurting hurting the the, the business of of those who had illicit or or biblically illegal practices. He was stealing business from those that were trying to, to profit off of religion and profit off of religious things and take advantage of the people. And they and they were offended, but especially the hierarchy of the religious had gotten so comfortable with their long flowing robes and they had gotten so comfortable with the attention that people gave them. They loved, they would stand out in the marketplace and they would pray out loud, not because they wanted God to hear, but they would pray out loud so everyone could see and hear how spiritual and special they were. And now comes this carpenter, this poor person that his followers are calling a rabbi and he's not behaving the same way. And while he's not behaving the same way, he's not putting on a show, there is a show. Blind eyes are being opened, deaf ears are are hearing again, the lame are walking, people are being changed and transformed, the demon possessed are being set free at a word, at his word. And the response of so many is so different. In fact, as the people are shouting, Hosanna, the, the religious folks go to Jesus and they say, you shouldn't let your disciples cheer like this. And Jesus' response is, if they don't cry out, the rocks will. Because what's happening here in your midst is greater than even you can imagine. And some were getting it, some weren't, but many were just drawn and they were attracted to see what was going on. And so you have probably have heard me share this before, but there's really three people around Jesus. There's his followers. Now, there is a difference between someone who's just following along with Jesus and someone who's following Jesus. And when I say there's followers, we'll say disciples because that's the word that he used, which by the way, Jesus didn't use the term Christian. He didn't call us to be Christians. He called us to be disciples. And you know, in our culture, 
Christianity and Christian has taken on so many different meanings. In fact, there are so many people that, that, that um, identify as Christian. But let me just say something that might hurt some feelings. Just because you identify as something doesn't make it true. But there were his disciples, his followers, and then there was the crowd, those, those that were drawn, that wanted to come see something. They were the spectators. And then there were the other folks, and today we're going to call them the offended or the critics. And I think we can relate to this in this day and age where you can, you can listen to someone speak or you can see someone post something online and immediately you have all three. You have those that agree, you have those that are just hanging out, and then you have those that become critics. And it's amazing these days. I saw someone recently just post something. It was just like a public service thing in the community. They saw someone, someone doing something they didn't like, so they said something. Um, and the amount of backlash and hatred that came, and it, it had to do with someone littering. And not that I agree with, with how the whole thing went, but just the amount of criticism and anger and hatred, it really, to me, it really reveals that there is an offended spirit that is resting on our culture. And the offended spirit isn't just, it isn't just offended with, with, with what someone believes or doesn't believe. It's offended with truth. And if truth hurts your feelings, then you're offended. I have bad news for the world. The truth hurts. Because truth is truth and there's only one truth. And Jesus said that if you are his disciples, if you do what he has taught, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I hear that quoted a lot by folks who don't actually know the truth. And they're the same ones that are offended when you don't adopt their truth. But here's the thing. There is really only one true. There is only one true. And we, and we have gotten into this whole thing, well, that's their truth. No, that's their opinion. That's their feeling. That's their position. That's their perspective. Fine. Fine. If you want to quack like a duck, have at it. But truth is truth. The truth is truth. And if that offends you, I love you. Jesus loves you, but he came to bring the truth so the truth will set you free. But what Jesus often faced, and the reason why Jesus was, was so, so polarizing is that people had developed their own truth. They had developed their own perspective. They had taken the law. They had taken their religion, and they had fit it to, com to be comfortable for them. They had fit it to, to prosper them and so that they could thrive in it. And then if anyone came along, and even if someone came along and said, this is what the truth says, and it contradicted what they held, what their truth was, immediately they got, effect they got offended to the point of yelling, crucify him. See, even in, even in this crowd, even the spectators, the same, many of the same people on this day that were shouting, Hosanna. Here comes the king, Hosanna. And they were whooping it up and they were, they were throwing down their cloaks and throwing down palm branches and they were cheering. Many of the same people who were shouting, Hosanna, shouted, crucify him just a week later. Because somewhere between the, 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 the thrill of arrival and the realization of who Jesus really is, the truth of who he was, somewhere in there, there was a change in their reception of Jesus. How do we, how do we receive Jesus? Well, his followers, they worshiped him. They participated. They were obedient to his word. John 8.31 says, Um, let me just read it. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus goes on to say that his disciples are those, paraphrasing, are those who behave like him, and do like him, and live like him. And you know, when Jesus came, 
one of the, the offensive parts of his message is he, is he came and he started challenging their 600 and some rules that they had taken out of the law. And, he, and they thought that he was saying that the law didn't count, but then he makes the statement, I have not come to abolish the law, I have come to fulfill it. You see, in mankind's, all of man's effort and everything that man had tried to do with the law, on our best day, keeping the rules doesn't fulfill the law. You have to become the fulfillment of the law in order for the law to, to work out. So Jesus comes with this message and he says things like, you've heard it said, thou shalt commit adultery, but I tell you that if you just lust in your heart, and everyone went, oh. I mean, the non-spiritual people in the room. <sighs> You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit murder, but I tell you, if you hate, now everybody go, ugh. Because that word hate doesn't mean despise. The Greek word means to love less. So if you want to raise the bar even higher. So Jesus, Jesus came in and he presented these these regulations and these rules, these laws that they had been trying to follow, and he's coming in and saying that's not enough. He says, you, you have the law, but you're law breakers. You can't even keep them. He makes this statement. He says, you basically, well, the modern translation is you throw out the baby with the bathwater. He says, you, you, you try to strain out a gnat only to swallow a camel. They're, they're trying to go after all these religious practices and all these things, and Jesus is coming with a different message. His message isn't change your behavior. His message is change your heart. And listen, in, our, in human nature, we get a little offended when someone comes with a rule book. We get really offended when someone says that we need to change who we are, how we are, how we think, how we believe. And listen, this is not a popular church growth sermon. That's why I'm not preaching it on Friday. <laughs> because in our human nature, we want the message that says, come as you are. Come as you are. God just loves you and all of your sin and all of your stuff and all your things. And yeah, just come just the way you are. And here, we'll promote you. And, we'll, and here, we'll, we'll just make life good, and you can have a Learjet, and you can wear a nice suit, and you can do all of these things. Oh, and try to, try to stop cussing. Try to, try to appear nicer. Put a, here, here's a bumper sticker. This will make you look holy. <laughs> but see, even in Jesus' culture, that was not working. That's exactly what they were trying to do. So he was coming with this message saying, the, the, this religion, this man-made rules and stuff that you have concocted are not working. The very things that is from the mouth of God, you, you, you've taken it and you've twisted it. It's not enough to try to keep the rules. You have to change from the inside out. And the folks who knew the law, the folks who were waiting and expecting the Messiah to come and save them, couldn't take it. They rejected Jesus because Jesus came and had a message that said, you want to be righteous? You want to be righteous? Let me change you. Pick up your cross. Die to yourself. Lay down your life. Love your enemy. Bless, don't curse. And it was all of these things that Jesus presented and, and, and he said, if you do these things, you're my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, his, his followers the, were those that could accept that Jesus was the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, and that confronts a whole lot, doesn't it? We want, we want the highway to heaven. I won't sing another song that... <laughs> highway to somewhere else <laughs> because that would offend you and you would but there's other great churches in town if you do get offended um, and then there's the spectators and the thing about the thing about the thing about the spectators and I would say that there's a lot of spectators still today Pastor Sean and the spectators are those that are drawn to the show those that know that there's something good there 
They know that they know they they really know they should be there, but they haven't really bought in. They're not ready to be a disciple. I'm okay being in the crowd, but I'm not sure if I want to be one of those followers. I'm not sure if I want to be one of those one of those Jesus freaks. I'm not sure if I want to be one of those people because. I, you know, I don't know. I was in worship, and there were, like, men raising their hand. Men. Men. And they were singing. Men. In public, Sean. And they don't even sing good. <laughs> and there was one man in church who had a tear coming down his eye. I'm from Homedale, Idaho. We don't act like that. That is undignified. I mean, I'll come to the show but don't expect me to participate. I'll come see. There's a problem with the spectators, and like I said earlier, many of the spectators were were standing there going, yeah, and a week later they were yelling, crucify him. Because they were moved by the influence of the world. They were moved by the influence of the crowd. And listen, that whole trial of Jesus with Pilate, when Pilate says, behold the man, What would you have me do with this man called Jesus? And the crowd is is out there and they're looking to see what the influencers are gonna say. And one influencer says, crucify him. And another one says, give me Barabbas. Kill him. And next thing you know, the crowd turns. And those that were there to see what was going to happen with Jesus, they were there to see what was going to happen when he came in, and they were there to see what was going to happen. Is this it? When Pilate breaks up, is he going to like raise his arm and an army is going to come out of nowhere with swords? And then all of a sudden, it doesn't happen. They're going to kill him. And now they're saying, if you're one of his followers, you might die too. Now suddenly the crowd turns. They like the show and they like the attention but they don't like being put on the spot. So the spectator quickly turns away when it's unpopular, when it's weird, when it's risky, when it might cost you something, when it might cost you your reputation, when it might cost you your convenience, or when you might have to sacrifice something. You know, I've, I, I've said this before, it's kind of a harsh statement, when, when I've, I've had a little bit of a whining bout, complaining, I know you can't believe it, Pastor whines. Not out loud, usually. Okay, don't ask my wife. You know, and there's been times where I've, I've kind of complained about the cost of things, but then this conviction comes. One time it was the Holy Spirit, now it's just the memory of the Holy Spirit bringing it up one time. And it was the statement, I wonder how uncomfortable the cross was. I wonder how inconvenient the lashing was. I wonder how inconvenient the betrayal was. It was totally inconvenient. But here's the thing. If we are not dedicated to be a disciple, a dedicated follower, a disciplined follower, where we are sold out to run after him no matter what, then when... It gets difficult, uncomfortable, challenging, or sacrificial, we fall back. There's no in-between. I don't believe there's any in-between. You're either sold out for Jesus or you're not. And that's a harsh statement. And if you're a guest today, love you. But I want you to think about it like this. If there is only one way to come to the Father, and that's through Jesus... How much room does that leave for indecision? None. It doesn't leave any room. And that, and that is not a, that's not a closed-minded, that's not a bigoted, that's not a whatever the world would like to say. In fact, that's an incredibly inclusive answer. The salvation seems exclusive. There's only one way. But it is inclusive that it's available to everyone who will receive it. John chapter 1 says, to those who believe, those who receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. But in this whole thing that we're talking about today, you have to receive him. If you don't receive, you 
then you don't have, then the right's not there. Then the, the consequence isn't there. And then, of course, I can spend more time talking about the offended, but I want to cheer you up before we go. <laughs> Mark 10. Assuredly, I say, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Many of those that were offended were offended because Jesus was accepting tax collectors and sinners and little kids, and he was hanging out with the unpopular, and it wasn't all about the pretty crowd. Not everyone had perfect teeth. Not everyone was dressed right, looked, like, looked right. You know what? I don't think Jesus' services were right on the clock, Pastor Sean. I think when Jesus gave a sermon, I think he preached as long as he had to. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think that anyone was worried about the AC. Well, I know they weren't. They weren't worried about the heat or the AC. They weren't worried about where their chair was. In fact, it was more like find a piece of grass, pick up a rock, where's a log. They were so eager to hear what Jesus had to say that they didn't have to have all of the creature comforts to get there. Okay. But yet, at the same time, those who were around Jesus had to overcome all of those other things in order to decide, am I going to be a disciple, am I going to be a spectator, or am I going to be offended? And many were offended because Jesus picked those that they wouldn't. (laughs) Uh, Can I just be honest for a moment? I would have never picked me. Never. You're like, oh no, what's wrong with him? I I know me. I would have never picked me. I probably would have picked you because you're so good looking. But look at Jesus' disciples tax collectors, hot headed fishermen. By the way, fishermen smell like fish. A zealot who was probably training for murder. I mean, there was, there was all sorts of people in his band, including one who handled the finances, who later betrayed him, and Jesus still washed his feet. He still had the opportunity and privilege to be a disciple. Not people that I would pick. And yet, and yet they got to be with Jesus. Why? Because they chose the path of disciple. And you know the best news about those that got to be disciples is when they chose to be disciples, or when actually Jesus chose them first, they chose to agree. And even then, they still goofed up. Peter still denied, yet got brought back. They still ran off. The sons of thunder wanted to call down fire from heaven. There were all of these things. They were constantly arguing and bickering amongst themselves. And still, in all of their fleshiness, Jesus still made them disciples. Would you stand to your feet? Okay, Pastor Sean, you have four minutes to wrap up the service. <laughs> hey, I want to, um, yeah, some of, the, some of this was, was pretty pointed today. And here's really what we should take away. The invitation is inclusive. The invitation to Christ is inclusive. In fact, I believe, I believe that as a disciple, we should never pick and choose who we think is going to come into the kingdom. We should assume he wants them all to come. You want to know why? Because the scripture says it's not his will that any, any, any. But what about predestination, pastor? Yes, he predestined that all who would receive him. All who believed would become children of God. Those who don't, that's the exclusivity. Those who reject him, those that are offended, those that, those that still want to walk on both sides of the fence. The, the problem is you can't be a disciple and offended at the same time. You can't be a disciple and a spectator at the same time. You can't, you can't be in the kingdom of God and, in the, and living the, king, the ways of the world at the same time. Scripture calls that double-minded. 
The follower of Christ is not perfect, but the follower of Christ makes the commitment that says, I'm gonna set my mind and my eyes on Jesus. I'm gonna be a disciple. I'm not gonna listen to the crowd or the world. And if Jesus' message offends me or confronts me or makes me uncomfortable, it must mean because there's something in me that needs to go, something that needs to change. Rather, rather than seeking my own comfort when I hear the word of God, I need to seek his righteousness because righteousness is uncomfortable to sin. And if there's, in, if there's discomfort going on today, I would just say, Lord, thank you for the gift of conviction and repentance. So would you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Listen, if this message is convicting your heart and you're just saying, you know, I just, whatever the response is, not living like a disciple, or I'm still, I'm still walking the way of the world, or I'm carrying offense, I'm choosing to allow offense, whether offense with Jesus or offense with Christians or offense with others, I'm just, I'm allowing offense to rule my life. Listen, whatever the conviction is, the answer is this, give it to Jesus. Word says, that he's faithful and just, that if you confess your sin, he will forgive you and cleanse you. So just right where you are, if you need to just get right, if you just need to get right, would you just say, that's me? You can just raise your hand. I just need to get right. Yeah, thank you. You just put it up and put it down. I just need to get right. And this is just between you and God. The hand is really just an acknowledgement. Jesus said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So, Lord, today, Lord, we just confess, Lord, the stuff that's keeping us from being your disciple. Lord, help us when you show up, Lord, to receive you as disciples, as your followers, to not be the crowd and especially to not be the offended. And Lord, whatever it is in our hearts, whatever it is in our lives that, that's out of alignment, according to your word, Lord, bring us in to alignment the way only you can do through your Holy Spirit. So Lord, we ask that you would do this in Jesus' name, amen.